Good morning, everyone who's in the Asia Pacific region. What time is it, Michael? I don't know. It's just after 5 a.m. here, it feels like, <laughs> but it's after 6 in the morning. So it's a very good morning from Melbourne if you are joining us uh, from this part of the world. But of course, very many people joining this PCF Prostic webinar are joining from completely different parts of the world. So good morning to all of you and good evening and good day and whatever. My name is uh, Declan Murphy, urologist at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre here in Melbourne. It's my great privilege to co-host another one of these fantastic PCF Prostic webinars along with um, my legendary co-host Professor Michael Hoffman, nuclear medicine physician and chief of all things prostate cancer at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. Michael, good morning. Good morning Declan, it's great to be here. It is. So we're coming to you from the new GUcast studio. We run a podcast called GUcast. Do search us out if you haven't heard already. Uh, and we talk a lot about this topic this morning, PSMA imaging and theranostics. Uh, but we focus on all things GU oncology. So we've, we're have we hijacking the GUcast studio to uh, do our bit, the Melbourne bit of this PCF Prostic uh, webinar today, which I'm really looking forward to. What's the, the theme today? The theme Michael? today is everything alpha. It's the hot topic and new targets, particularly... A little bit of a focus on neuroendocrine prostate cancer and whether we can do something better than PSMA. And I suppose the backdrop is it's been such an exciting time for radioligand therapy and prostate cancer the last few years with the betas. Um, but uh, we believe this is just the start of the journey in radioligand therapy and prostate cancer. And the focus of these webinars that we've been running with PCF for the past three years has really been to go a bit deeper into all of this stuff. We've had some really, really good webinars with key investigators and researchers from around the world over the past few years. They're all archived on the GUcast channel and the Prostate channel. Uh, so please go back and look. But this is a, a really delicious look to jumping beyond where we are with Lutetia and PSMA. And for that, to that end, you've assembled a fantastic panel again, Michael, which uh, we'll introduce as we go on. Um, uh, but we should, I suppose, introduce our studio team here as well today, shouldn't we? We do. We've got a special guest, uh, Dr. Mawa Rahimi, who's one of our radio chemists, uh, one of our young investigators on our PCF Tactical Awards, uh, so we really like to get the young investigators in involved and we've also got Dr James Buteau, who's also a young investigator, he's doing a PhD and uh, doing too many projects to talk about. <laughs> and if you're watching this on the webinar or backwards on YouTube, that's him sitting over there in the corner wearing his, what do you call that thing James on your head? Well, it's a toque, the French Canadian, I swapped the uh, GU cast from one from last year for this Canadian version. Toque. So it looks like a beanie to me, but James is there in the corner of uh, the GUcast studio wearing his toque. Um, all right, Michael, I suppose we should have a think about uh, who else we need to introduce. Maybe I'll just click to the slides to see how many people are online. Uh, so we had an amazing number of registrants. This is the global map uh, with uh, uh, how many people have joined. At the moment, we have over 450 people online and we had over 1,000 register from 74 countries, which is a prostic wow. record. Wow, that's very, there's yeah, a lot so of interest. Of where people are from, it's quite extraordinary. And it's actually 75 because someone from Iran emailed me to say that wasn't on the list of countries in, in Zoom webinar. Wow. So they had to pick Turkey instead. So welcome if you're online. Well, welcome to all our friends in Iran. Yep. And then where, what sort of jobs do people do? The majority were identified as nuclear medicine doctors. Uh, but we've got a good range of people from industry, uh, urology, radiation oncology, a lot of radiopharmaceutical scientists. We have some consumers online too. Uh, oh, just clicking. I go back. Go back. Go back. There we go. And then there was this other category. And there were quite a few others, so I was wondering what they were. And they were medical physicists. We had a lot of radiation safety officers. Uh, so that's that's interesting. They're keeping an uh, eye on you, they're Michael. They're keeping an eye on us. Yes. And some radiochemists, interestingly, did not identify as radiopharmaceutical scientists. They thought they had a separate identity. Um, these slides are auto-advancing. We might need to change that PowerPoint setting. Uh, and we have a lot of consumers online, so welcome consumers, but we cannot give you medical advice today. For people online, you can post a Q&A at any time. Uh, do that in the Q&A option at the bottom. Uh, don't use the chat option. Use Q&A. And, uh, and we'll also bring some people online onto the panel. So if you want to join the panel for everyone to talk live, either have your audio and or video ready. And during the Q&A time, we can advance you into the panel. And that'll be great. So And, and feel free to 
send me or James Buteau or Declan a message uh, if you want us to move you in. All right. Fantastic. So uh, we do have a very, very good panel today, Michael, but we want to uh, go over to our friends at PCF in California uh, to welcome them to say hello as well. So who have we got on the line first? It's uh, Dr. Howard Sewell. I th well, thank you uh, to the Peter Mac team for putting together this awesome group of investigators to talk about a topic that's very near to us. Uh, last year, we were fortunate to have the resources to fund two $10 million, eight to $10 million programs in nuclear medicine that are both represented on this panel uh, from, from Sloan Kettering with collaborators at Dana-Farber and, and et al. And of course the Peter Mack group, all about alpha and all about new targets. So we're delighted to be here today. Uh, Declan and Michael, thank you for the opportunity and look forward to learning a lot. Thanks very much, Howard, and always lovely to have you on the panel. And thanks, of course, to uh, everyone at PCF for all their amazing support for what we do. Uh, and we have Dr. Andrea Miahira as well on the line. Andrea, good evening to you. Good afternoon in California. Afternoon. Good evening to wherever, whoever has the evening going on in the world. Um, I just want to echo Howard and say thank you to the Peter Mack team for putting on this amazing webinar. And I'll also thank, thank you to all of our panelists. I think great program and I look forward to everything I'm going to learn about Alpha. Yeah, for sure. Michael, so uh, what's next? So we're going to start with the Memorial Sloan Kettering team and they're going to tell us about their tactical award. Uh, so we have a good mixture of radiochemist, medical oncology and nuclear medicine specialist uh, all online. Uh, so that's great. We've got uh, Michael Morris, who will lead off and share his screen for, for his talk. Uh, he leads uh, the uh, prostate and GU oncology program at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And also Lisa Baudet. Lisa, I know from my early days in nuclear medicine, because uh, Dr. Baudet was doing everything related to neuroendocrine tumours with lutetium dotatate, uh, which is how I got into the field. And uh, I learned a lot from you, Lisa. So thank you for joining and good to see that you've moved into prostate cancer as well. And uh, we also have Jason Lewis, who is chair of the uh, radiochemistry uh, department. And uh, he's joining us on leave, uh, so thank you. So uh, he'll chime in and answer the tricky questions that uh, Mike and Lisa are struggling with. Uh, so welcome everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. We'll hand over to you, Mike, and the memorial team. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. And I'm hoping, Declan, that we get as uh, freebies that very attractive GU cast shirt that I see that you uh, that you you have, but none of your your colleagues seem to have. So perhaps it's a special thing that we can share it. Well, you know, like they, they all have some, but they just don't wear it. But I'm going to uh, get you some GU cast merch because I know you'll wear it. And when you're absolutely New York, yeah. we'll, we'll put the merch on and spread the word. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we got you. Very good. So we're going to talk about uh, new targets. And this work, of course, um, is really enabled by PCF and the generosity of the organization and its donors. And uh, we'd like to just put that up front. Thank you very much, Howard um, and Andrea, for funding this research. These are Lisa's and my uh, disclosures. And I'm going to start off with um, a figure that's from um, Misha Beltran's group, and I hear she's on the call. So, uh, Misha, this I uh, just want to credit you. And if there's anything that you think that we uh, misstate, then you'll have an opportunity to correct. But um, what we're talking about is treatment emergent metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. And for those who may not be inculcated in the prostate cancer world, around 15 to 20% of patients who are treated with contemporary anti-androgen receptor therapy uh, transform into, via process called lineage plasticity, into a new form of prostate cancer, one which frequently isn't AR driven, but could be. Uh, and this is characterized under a variety of nomenclatures, but for at least today's purposes, we're going to call it neuroendocrine prostate cancer. Neuroendocrine prostate cancer emerges 
via a whole host of a variety of mechanisms that look like they are triggered or accelerated by, by treatment with anti-AR uh, directed therapy. And those mechanisms include loss of tumor suppressors, activators of tumor growth, and also epigenetic phenomena. Um, and this process is very complex, very, very heterogeneous, but despite that heterogeneity, we're talking about a large group of patients at the end of the day who develop these biologic changes. And this is very poorly treatable disease. It's really difficult to actually find effective and durable treatment. And indeed, we would say that right now, there really is no standard of care for these patients, despite uh, a lot of available therapies for others. So um, we're going to be talking about delta ligand, delta-like ligand 3. Uh, DLL3 is expressed in some neuroendocrine disease. It's, it's actually quite copiously expressed in other more common neuroendocrine type disease like small cell lung cancer. Um, in prostate cancer, though, it emerges really at least the, the, the variety that we're talking about today in the treatment emergent context well after the patient has been treated with uh, AR-directed therapy. And you can see that in the top left panel, which uh, Misha's group published um, uh, a, a couple of years ago, in which you see the neuroendocrine expression come forth in the neuroendocrine group, but isn't really present in the adeno group and certainly not in the benign or newly treated disease. Uh, this is true as well in terms of H scores, and you can see it on our uh, IHC uh, grid here. If you look at the bottom right here at the neuroendocrine disease and under the DLL3 column, that is the treatment group that we're really talking about today, um, which is a singularly difficult uh, disease phenomena to treat. And as you can see from these Kaplan-Meier curves representing the patients that these data would uh, derive from, the folks with the DLL positive disease have a worse prognosis than the folks who have the DLL negative disease. Now, targeting DLL3 is something that's happening really across the board because this is uh, a significant need in prostate cancer. There really are no treatments available, as I mentioned. And so immunotherapeutics are being de developed against DLL3. This figure is from a bispecific antibody uh, made by Amgen, AMG757, but there are other companies such as Harpoon as well that have molecules targeting DLL3 on one end of the bispecific and CD3 on the other. So um, this is uh, one approach. Another approach could be, of course, CAR-Ts. Another approach still that ha actually has been tested and already reported is uh, Rova-T and ADC. Um, and some of the folks who presented this at ASCO 2021 um, with uh, Rahul Agarwal as the uh, presenting author, uh, maybe on this call, it looked like it had modest response rates, some toxicities. But I would point out that all of the trials that are looking at these current approaches are unselected trials. And I, th I think that by the end of this call, you'll see that there's an advantage to the Theranostic approach in, in, uh, in having an ability to select for the patients who are DLL3 positive, and then to, develop, to uh, deliver therapy that's targeted against those sites of disease. So with that, I'm gonna now uh, bring the um, microphone, so to speak, to Lisa, who's gonna talk through some of the preliminary data that we have published on the Theranostic pair that we are developing in order to treat DLL3 positive disease. And she's gonna walk us through the next couple of slides. And with that, Lisa, why don't you take it away? Thank you so much, Michael. And first of all, let me thank uh, 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 Michael and Declan for this uh, kind invitation. I'm delighted to be here. So uh, let me walk you through these uh, few slides. So. Um, we've introduced uh, um, DLL3 uh, target, and um, 
So neuroendocrine uh, prostate cancer lesions can be imaged with uh, uh, DLL3 targeted antibodies, which are um, the uh, SC16 antibodies uh, labeled with zirconium 89. So in this slide, you can see the results from our group uh, uh, where we studied um, um, cell lines um, exhibiting neuroendocrine differentiation like the H660. Uh, so they have uh, synaptophysin positivity staining, whilst the LN cap uh, cell lines does not exhibit uh, neuroendocrine differentiation and actually exhibits markers of differentiation such as uh, the androgen receptor and the PSMA. So we have the um, availability of tracers to target these three receptors. We have gallium PSMA-11 for PSMA. We have zirconium DFO SC16 for DLL3 and dotatate for somatostatin receptor expression. So you see in this mouse model, you see the figure on the left part of the panel, as expected, no PSMA or somatostatin receptor expression, which is uptake, were observed in the uh, H660 um, xenographs uh, using uh, imaging and immunostochemistry. So you see the, um, the, the, the three panels below and the, the lesion is on uh, on the left. Uh, instead, these tumors expressed intense uh, SC16 uptake, as you can see in the mid-low uh, uh, panel. Vice versa, um, the LN cap tumors expressed uh, uh, PSMA and not the LL3, and Dolatate actually was not very informative. Uh, so our group has tested the utility of zirconium DFO S616 to selectively image DLL3 expressing uh, neuroendocrine prostate cancer models, and uh, they successfully uh, successfully demonstrated that uh, um, DFO S616 uh, uh, antibodies clearly delineates these tumors in uh, subcutaneous xenografts. Uh, and as you can see from the histograms on the on the right, we have high targets over background ratio. So the, the tumor uptake is much higher than the uptake in the blood or any other organs. Um, and most importantly, tumor uptake is significantly higher in DLL3 positive tumors compared to DLL3 negative tumors. So next, please. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm hitting, there we go. Okay, there go ahead. Go. All right, so this is preliminary results from our uh, zirconium DFO uh, C16 PET study. So these are two actual patients, um, and the, I, I believe that the images speak um, to the heterogeneity from themselves uh, to the heterogeneity in um, neuroendocrine prostate cancer differentiation and the heterogeneity of target expression. So the subject on the left has a metastatic uh, any, uh, PC predominantly diffused to the liver uh, uh, with other lesions in the cervical thoracic nodes and the lungs. Uh, as you can see, the DLL3 uptake uh, uh, in the liver overlaps uh, the uptake at the FDG PET scan. Uh, the patient on the right has diffuse uh, metastatic disease to nodes uh, and bones, and the uptake at the DFO SC16 PET, uh, which is um, the DLL3 PET, as you can see, uh, recapitulates the distribution of uptake at FDG PET. So, and I would also like to point out the low background uptake and the significant targeting of the tumor lesions allowed by the DLL3 uh, PET scan. Now, the next one. And uh, so the next logical step uh, uh, in our group after demonstrating the presence um, of the target and the efficient localization of the targeting antibodies uh, was to develop a targeted radionuclide therapy following the theranostic principle. So we conducted a, a preliminary animal study in which we evaluated the lutetium version of SC16 antibodies, so lutetium-177 DTPA SC16, in neuroendocrine prostate cancer xenograft bearing mice. Um, the, uh, the cells obviously are the H660. 
And we assessed the, the treatment efficacy and specificity at three different dosages of lutetium DTPAS 16. Um, so we have the 4.6, uh, 9.25, and 27.8 megabecquerel per mice per mouse. Um, at, at all the three tested dosages, um, complete responses were observed, as you can see from the um, the. the the, the graph on the left part of the slides. So the particularly if you if you look at the blue and the red curves, the 9.25 and the 27.8 megabecquerel curves um, were um, the curves that demonstrated that the dosages were curative. When we use the lower tested dosages, we obtain complete responses in some, in 63%, but we were successfully achieving a complete response with retreatment. Um, so obviously, this constitutes the basis for translation in human, also of the therapeutic approach. Thank you. Over to you. Thanks so much, Lisa. So I'm just going to take our presentation home to, the, to its end now. Um, First of all, I want to emphasize that what we're developing for prostate cancer will also have applicability for small cell lung cancer. And hence, on our tactical grant, we have uh, uh, John Poirier, we have uh, Charlie Rudin, lung cancer experts who will be able to translate what we develop from the prostate cancer world and this funding mechanism into the small cell lung cancer world as well. As well. And therefore, we hope to benefit with the grant, not just one group of patients with prostate cancer, but entire, an entire other disease which represents its own significant healthcare issue. You can see that uh, we have laboratory investigators, we have nuclear medicine uh, scientists, and as well chemists, we have uh, clinicians and uh, Samir Zaidi, who's our junior investigator, who works in uh, Charles Sawyer's labs. And uh, we also have Felix Fang, who couldn't join us today, but um, but uh, providing um, a lot of the uh, aim in terms of developing CRISPR models to optimize therapy. What we hope to do in the course of the grant is uh, develop next-gen uh, therapeutic and radio uh, and diagnostic radio tracer companions for full theranostic approach to the DLL3 positive uh, prostate cancer patient, as well as the small cell lung cancer patient, um, to develop mouse models to, in order to better biologically characterize this disease state, and also CRISPR screens to understand what the controlling genes are in terms of DLL3 expression and how to best optimize those as well as other therapeutics that might promote DLL3 expression and therefore uh, enrich the target. Just to give you a preview of this, this is from Samir, who has been uh, studying the biology from these patients. These patients are all biopsied after they are uh, imaged. And you can see that even within this um, single cell data, that even within a specific lesion, that there are neuroendocrine positive, there are DLL3 positive and DLL3 uh, negative uh, uh, foci within a specific lesion. So there's both interpatient variability and, and heterogeneity, intra, intrapatient heterogeneity, and intralesional um, heterogeneity as well. And also he's uh, showing the expression patterns that are of other markers that are associated with DLL3 positive and DLL3 negative foci of disease. So to conclude, what are, what are the takeaway lessons from this? So first of all, neuroendocrine prostate cancer is a substantial healthcare concern because we're talking about 15 to 20% of all metastatic CRPC. It's a lot of men and it's a lot of men without a good treatment option. But second of all, prostate cancer is actually not small cell lung cancer in the sense that we're seeing a lot more heterogeneous DLL3 uh, expression. And I think that the images that Lisa just walked you through show how you can really assess within a given patient using the imaging whether the crucial disease is expressing DLL3 that, uh, uh, or that is hepatic disease, 
whether the, a patient that's progressing, whether that patient, that those progressive lesions are DLL3 positive or not, but it's, it's really important to understand that interpatient and intrapatient heterogeneity, the imaging will be key to a theranostic approach. And I would argue that our imaging data would suggest that those agents that currently are being developed in the immunotherapy world and the ADC world would do a lot better if there were an imaging companion in order to identify those patients likely to respond. Because as you can see, there's a lot of heterogeneity here and you don't want a really good drug to yield a disappointing result simply because the correct patient selection criteria weren't applied. So I think that there's an overall drug development lesson uh, for the neuroendocrine population. Finally, I'd like to advocate that we not try to characterize biologically what is a very, very uh, broad group of patients that we're all sort of terming neuroendocrine prostate cancer, but maybe start referring to these patients simply by the manifestation of the target, i.e. DLL3 positive prostate cancer, not try and subcategorize these patients into various groupings that we don't fully understand yet. And with that, I just want to thank again, uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation, and as well, um, Declan and Michael and the whole group at the Peter Mac for allowing us the opportunity to present our uh, data. Thanks so much. Amazing. Uh, that was stunning work. I have to say, I'm, I'm completely blown away. <laughs> Thanks, Team Memorial. It's a it's yeah. a really nice example of team science because you just have so many disciplines working seamlessly together. And I think uh, that's what uh, PCF do extremely well is bring all these different craft groups together to, to do amazing stuff. Uh, so we're going to switch checks from DLL3 to uh, choice of alpha emitters and our tactical submission uh, was together with UCLA, UCSF and our colleagues in Essen in Germany. And our focus was on using LED212 as an alpha emitter labelled to both PSMA uh, but also novel targets including uh, DLL3. Uh, so we're not going to have time to go through our tactical in as much detail as the memorial group just did. So we're going to focus and narrow it down to just led to and to and hand over to Mawa to uh, tell us why we chose this unusual compound. It's a little bit unusual because, you know, in nuclear medicine, we shield radiation with lead. Mm -hmm. So to treat a patient with lead sounds a bit paradoxical. I, I'm intrigued. Mawa, right. yeah, good morning and welcome. Thanks for getting up so early in the morning and joining us. No worries you. at all. I'm excited to be here. Fantastic. Um, okay, let's have a conversation about lead 212 and alpha therapy in general. So targeted alpha therapy, it's a innovative, very successful approach for the management of many different intractable cancers. And it relies on the overexpression of oncogenic receptors uh, in cancer cells compared to healthy cells. So if we look a little bit closer at this concept, we see that the radioactive dose is delivered to the cancer cell using a targeting agent. These targeting agents are selected for their incredible Uh, to the um, receptor target. So this is a very simplified version of the events that actually occur, but the key things I want to impress is the choice of the alpha emitter and the targeting agents. So I could talk at length about this, and I'm sure we'll have a discussion about this afterwards as well, but the focus of this talk will be just the use of lead 212 uh, in targeted alpha therapy. It's physical characteristics that make it really special as a candidate um, and going through some of the challenges as well. But before we begin, I want to look at why, why are we using alpha in the first place? What gap is it fulfilling that beta emitters aren't currently? So the radiopharmaceutical properties of both alpha and beta emitters uh, they're characterized by two main features, their range and their linear energy transfer. It's a basically a measurement of how powerful it is. Beta particles like lutetium-177, very well known to most of our audience, hopefully, they have a path length of about 10 millimeters, one centimeter, um, and, but they produce sparse ionization energy. Alpha emitters like lead-212, on the other hand, have a much narrower part length, about one-tenth of the beta, uh, but they're a thousand times more powerful. So these two 
when combined, make the perfect complementary pair for therapy for patients. So you can treat uh, <laughs> patients initially, their medium to large tumours, uh, by irradiating a large site with safe levels of beta emitters, and then chase that up with alpha emitters like lead-212 to target those individual cells, those microcancers that can arise. The alphas are able to deliver cytotoxic doses, lethal cytotoxic doses of uh, radiation to the cells, inducing cell death. And at this stage, there's no resistance mechanism for this yet. So this makes alpha an incredibly promising approach for cancer therapy. Let's look at lead-212 a little bit closer. And for this, I'm going to benchmark it against actinium-225. It's Both of these target very similar cancers. Actinium-225 is the uh, current golden child at the moment. So they can both exist in the same space. It's not adversarial. It's technically not a versus. But I think it's a good comparison to have in this. So lead-212 is uh, generated using parents' thorium-228 or radium, and there are generators available using both of these parents. Uh, thorium-228 has a half-life of about two years, and so we can get generators that have a year shelf life, which is really great. Uh, Actinium-225, on the other hand, has two modes, but primarily through radiochemical extraction. The majority of it that exists in the world today is through radiochemical extraction. Um, unfortunately, because it, its parents are uranium-233 and thorium-229, there is overall a limited supply of it and globally only about 68 gigabecquerels is being produced annually, uh, enough for about 100 patients. Uh, because of this limited supply there has been investigations into accelerator based, accelerator based routes using radium-226. This is a more cost effective and scalable production route compared to radiochemical extraction but there is of course the um, issues of using radium-226, and it also doesn't produce as pure an isotope. So let's look at their, compare their decay profiles a little bit as well. Uh, both lead-212 and actinium-225 are what are considered in vivo alpha generators, in that once injected, they continue to produce alpha daughters as part of their decay. So lead produces a single therapeutically applicable daughter, uh, bismuth-212, highlighted in orange, uh, whereas actinium-225 produces four daughters. Um, theoretically, what this means is actinium-225 is a little bit more powerful. It produces four times as many daughters, so it should be able to deliver four times the amount of radioactivity. But on the other side, so it is able to do that, but it can also have a bit of a um, recoil, like a ricochet effect with all of these alphas um, ricocheting off each other. It can sometimes irradiate neighbouring uh, tissues, maybe have some unfavourable accumulation in the kidneys, which is what we've seen previously. So let's look at another really positive aspect of lead-212. It's its clinically suitable half-life. Its half-life is 11 hours, which makes it really great for use in nuclear medicine. It allows for possibility of offering the patients outpatient treatment, as well as having really manageable waste. It's still alpha emitters, but it's a little bit more manageable due to its lower half-life. Um, it's also able to deliver nine, greater than 99% of its cell-killing radiation in only 72 hours. Finally, we can't end the talk without talking about some of the challenges. Uh, these, unfortunately, are not just uh, to lead to 12. This is a pretty universal uh, challenges met by most alpha emitters. The first is the availability of these emitters for radiopharmaceutical research and the clinic. Um, at the moment, demand is outstripping supply, but there are companies like Advanced Cell, Perspective Therapeutics, uh, Bio, Aranamed, who are meeting these challenges. They're producing lead generators or they're optimizing uh, current lead sulfate. Uh, there's also the potential for regular emitted breakdown of these generators. They can, um, these alpha emitters produce mag of okay, magnitude of energy, and so they can break down to energy and altitude inside the generators. And as always with any radio meteorite, there's still green handling uh, protocols. We're hoping to get a lead generator established at Peter McCallum Cancer Center in Victoria. And so there are a lot of licensing issues that we need to go through in order to do that. But despite all of that, lead to 12 fits a lot of boxes. It um, has a lot of the different uh, properties that we really like. And in my opinion, it is first in class um, if we figure out alpha emitted first. That's it, everybody. Thank you so much, Marwa. That was just amazing. Apologies, we're having a couple little audio glitches.
Oh, did it's we? Sorry. It's Declan's new GU Cast <laughs> studio. It's, uh, and, and some slide issues. I think if you can't see the slide big, you can click on your window that has the slide and picks. Uh, it gets yeah, on. it was supposed to be spotlighted out, but Zoom Spotlight doesn't seem to be working this morning. So um, you can pin uh, pin the individual window, window if you're not seeing it. But uh, yeah, stunning stuff. LEDs, very exciting, I must say. Very uh, exciting. Uh, so we are actively working on a LED 212 program thanks to uh, that uh, uh, PCF tactical grant. And we're going to have two more speakers. Uh, one is going to focus on translation of alpha to the clinic with an actual alpha PSMA study that's almost ready to go. And then we're going to talk to someone who's actually done some alpha therapy and get some experience. What is it actually like? So first up, we've got uh, David Patterson, who's a nuclear medicine physician and also an endocrinologist trained in both uh, at Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital here in Australia. And he is helping to lead one of the very first trials of uh, LED 212 PSMA that I think is going to kick off shortly in his centre. Uh, so hand over to you, David. Please uh, share your slides. Great. Uh, thanks, Michael and Declan. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you this morning here in Brisbane. Um, so I'll be talking about LED uh, 212 radioligand therapy for prostate cancer. I'll just move that slide forward. Uh, and this has been covered uh, in, a, in a previous talk. Um, but essentially, you know, the real advantages of lead as opposed to other, uh, you know, uh, radionuclide therapy isotopes is, you know, as an alpha, it's got a high linear energy uh, threshold. Uh, it's got a half-life that's, you know, well matched to the ligand half-life as opposed to, um, you know, lutetium-177 uh, or certainly in comparison to actinium-225, which has got a half-life of, uh, of 10 days. Um, there's relatively straightforward uh, production capabilities uh, and there is, you know, increasing and growing supply. We're not there yet, but there's certainly, you know, a bright future with, um, you know, significant uh, quantities of, of thorium available uh, for production, um, as opposed to, as we know, certainly with lutetium-177, there are, you know, issues, it's established production, but there are, you know, issues with, with global supply and demand at the moment. Um, and there also is uh, feasible SPECT imaging for dosimetry, um, which is uh, not capable, which actinium-225 can't deliver, um, which, is, which is also appealing. Um, when it comes to the two, uh, LED-212 generators uh, and the decay schema, um, this is just two of the different uh, available uh, products. So with advanced cell, um, that uses a thorium uh, parent. Uh, for production of, uh, of quite pure lead 212 uh, and perspective therapeutics is one of the other options which has opted for a radium 224 parent uh, within that uh, lead generator. As previously mentioned, um, lead has favorable characteristics really as an in vivo generator of bismuth 212, which is a, an alpha emitter. Uh, and in contrast to, um, to actinium, this just has uh, it can decay either via polonium, uh, delivering an alpha, uh, or via um, thallium with another alpha emission. Um, and implications for this mean that with the uh, with the thera with a the therapeutic activity sort of in the order of, you know, presumably 100 to to 200 uh, megabecquerels, it also provides the opportunity for for imaging, um, which is not capable with a much lower dose uh, administered or much lower activity administered. Um, with other alpha emitters like actinium-225. Um, just moving on, this is some of the preclinical data and uh, which has been developed by Thomas uh, Kreitzer and, and I'm grateful for Advanced Cell for sharing this slide. Uh, but uh, LED-212 uh, ADVC001, which is the compound which has been developed and will be uh, used in, in our trial, um, is, is quite similar to uh, lutetium-177 PSMA INT, um, but with some minor modifications. And in this preclinical uh, mouse study, um, it's shown that there is a significantly greater, uh, you know, tumour to, to, um, to kidney ratio in comparison to lutetium PSMA INT, which has much greater um, renal excretion. So this is hopefully uh, useful to provide a, a greater uh, therapeutic index. 
Um, and our, we'll also credit uh, Melissa Lata, who's uh, and the, the Q-Trace radiochemistry team at our, our statewide lab um, that have been working with Advanced Cell uh, to bring this ready for, uh, for clinical use uh, imminently. Um, and with regard to efficacy, again, this is preclinical data, um, again, provided by, by Thomas Kreitzer from Advanced Cell. Um, but this was a, a trial in, uh, in mice, uh, and essentially what it was comparing was either there were two doses of uh, either lutetium PCMA INT or one dose, that was the, uh, that's the green line here, um, or one dose of lutetium PCMA INT and one of uh, lead 212 ADV C001. Uh, and the, the third uh, arm was of, of two doses of, uh, of, the, of the lead ADV C001. And you can see here, in terms of tumor volume, it was greater impact with the, the two doses of, um, of the lead investigational uh, compound. In terms of survival of the mice, um, after the administration, again, there's a statistically significant uh, increased survival um, with, the, with the ADV C001 compound and also um, less change in, in, in body weight of those mice. So that's the, the, um, the preclinical data. When we think about lead, it's good to know that it has been used uh, in humans and, and has some therapeutic effect. Now, this is a different tumor type, but this was just recently published a phase one trial of lead dotemtate in, uh, in, in metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, phase one trial, up to 2.5 megabecquerels per kilogram. Um, and really out of, out of 20 patients, there was quite you know, exceptional, some exceptional responders, an overall 80% objective response rate. So that's sort of a proof of concept that as a, as a targeted um, radionuclide therapy, it is effective. So looking to the trial that, that will be commencing uh, imminently at the Royal Brisbane, it's a phase one, two dose escalation toxicity study uh, of this lead compound. So two, uh, lead 212 ADV C001. Um, and essentially the trial uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria are quite similar to the therapy study. Uh, and so it's got a, we've, we've uh, uh, borrowed a similar name, the therapy B study, um, but essentially it's in patients with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer, uh, prior um, androgen receptor targeted therapy and, and taxane exposure or contraindication. Um, it uses similar um, PET uh, criteria to the therapy study. So with gallium PCMA, issue max greater than 20 uh, at a site of disease and greater than 10 at all measurable sites and also without um, FDG over discordant disease. Um, looking at the, at the trial schema, um, it's, there'll be uh, a maximum of 18 patients uh, with receiving up to four cycles if tolerated, and it's a, a standard, relatively standard three plus three dose escalation design. Um, the initial four planned cohorts uh, are at 60, 90, 120, and 150 megabecquerels. Um, and there will be a period of, of safety follow-up. Uh, and there is actually uh, some imaging uh, components to evaluate preliminary response. Primary outcomes, uh, dose limiting toxicity and to determine the maximum toler uh, tolerated dose. Um, but as mentioned, there is some uh, PSMA PET response um, and, and looking at uh, clearance uh, in blood and urine and, and significant adverse events. Uh, and just finally, to finish off my presentation, um, there's been some great work by our medical physics team in looking more closely at the potential for SPECT imaging uh, of lead 212. And so this has just been some work um, showing that there is the capacity for imaging at, uh, at therapeutic doses. And so this is just currently um, being built into the protocol, which is just delayed commencement of the trial slightly, um, but it should be ready to commence in the next month or so. And quite interesting, one of the things that Matthew's discovered is that you can actually uh, image LED 212 at these uh, administered activities using a PET camera, um, which is via, uh, surprisingly via pair production from the, the very high energy gamma ray from, uh, from thallium 208. Um, so I might just, uh, just leave it there and we can um, move on with the presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, David. Uh, look, uh, alpha therapy with PSMA is not new. It's been done by our German colleagues for quite a number of years now, 
and also in many other countries, in, including by some groups in Australia. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that we still don't have any prospective data. All the uh, experience to date has been compassionate access uh, individual uh, cases. Uh, so commend you on getting some prospective trials underway because I think we really need that to move the field forward. And our next and last speaker before we have our Q&A is Dr Megan uh, Crumbaker from St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. She works with uh, Professor Louise Emmett, uh, one, of our medical one of our nuclear medicine colleagues, and uh, they've been doing a study of actinium-225, PSMA-617, and uh, Megan's been kind enough to share uh, some of the data on actinium uh, to date and uh, some of her perspectives uh, as a medical oncologist. So over to you, Megan. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, so just to be clear, the phase one study that we're doing with the actinium is still underway, so I can't share any results, but um, there is previous data of this um, agent um, and I'll present that and then just some of my perspectives just roughly from the patients I've treated. So, um, I'm not going to belabor this point. We've already talked about the um, uh, perks of an uh, or the pros and cons of an alpha emitter. Um, so, but specifically today, I'll talk to talk about two two five actinium um, PSMA six one seven. So, so keep in mind there are some antibody um, uh, tracers going around as well. But I'm specifically talking about the peptide. Um, uh, so it does have a longer half-life than the um, lead that's been previously discussed. So it's got a half-life of 10 days, but um, with it being an alpha emitter, we're still able to um, treat patients as an outpatient um, uh, despite that longer half-life. Um, and we talked about some of the advantages of an alpha emitter, the higher energy deposition and the shorter path length. Um, and, you know, potentially this is going to overcome uh, radiation resistance in some of the lutetium PSMA resistant um, patients may improve uh, responses in patients with a lower PSMA expression because you're not, you don't need as much of the um, uh, agent to, to enter the cell to cause cell death. And perhaps it will be better at treating micrometastatic disease for these reasons. Um, but I guess the other question is, is we know prostate cancer is very heterogeneous, despite the PET scan looking very homogeneous. Um, when we do a piece of my PET, um, we know at the cellular level, there's a lot of heterogeneity. So with that shorter path length, are you going to miss out on kind of collateral cell kill of other cells that don't have um, the uh, piece of my expression compared to a beta emitter like lutetium? So looking at the data that's already in existence for actinium PSMA 617, um, there is a meta-analysis of six retrospective studies, and we always know that retrospective data is not as high quality as prospective um, in general, but it included 201 patients across these six studies. And the PSA um, 50 response rate, so the patients that had a fall in their PSA by 50% or more, was 66%, um, uh, which is similar to what we're seeing in a lot of the um, lutetium studies that we've seen in men with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. Um, but the side effect um, profile is, is, um, is slightly greater than what we see generally in the lutetium studies, and particularly it's hematological toxicity um, and the xerostomia. Um, and again, particularly because of peptide, we get a lot of that uptake in the salivary glands. So the rates of xerostomia, um, more than three quarters of the patients had xerostomia of any grade and 3% had grade three. Um, uh, anemia in about a third of patients and thrombocytopenia in um, about 15%. And there were, you know, not, not insignificant numbers with grade three toxicities with the anemia and the thrombocytopenia, which is, you know, very substantial and potentially needing transfusional support. With um, the actinium, there's also been um, low rates of nephrotoxicity, particularly tubular interstitial process. Um, and in this study there, in this retrospective anal meta-analysis, there were um, a 3% uh, rate of uh, grade three um, nephrotoxicity. There has been another study, again, retrospective data um, uh, published on um, specifically men who have previously been treated with lutetium PSMA and then progressed. Um, very, it's a very heterogeneous population. The definition of what lutetium failure or progression was, was 
um, not clearly defined. But in this study, I think this is really key because we're, you know, we're all, we're looking at the the alphas as potentially um, something that can be used sequentially um, in men who have failed lutetium as another option if they still have persistent PSMA avid disease. In this um, uh, study on that presented data on 26 men, again, the PSA response rate, the 50% or more um, PSA fall was was very similar, um, but these are small numbers. So obviously the range and the, the confidence intervals are gonna be quite, quite wide, but about 65%. You say 50% response rate. So you're getting good um, levels of response. Um, the PSA progression free survival was only three and a half months, but again, you're seeing a really big range here. And the overall survival was 7.7 .7 months, which sounds low, but these were very heavily pretreated men, including you know, multiple lines of chemotherapy, androgen and signaling inhibitors, um, uh, such as abiraterone and enzalutamide. And also they all had had lutetium as well. So very heavily pretreated. Um, keeping that in mind, these are heavily pretreated men. Um, the the rates of toxicity compared to the data in the um, meta analysis are higher. So, looking specifically at grade three to four toxicity. Um, uh, so, you know, with anemia, we're talking about levels less than eighty, um, and with the thrombocytopenia, less than fifty thousand. Um, and, uh, you know, the rates of grade three to four anemia at 35%, that's similar to the rate of any grade uh, anemia uh, in that, in that meta-analysis of the 201 patients. Um, so that's really substantial. You know, most of those patients are needing blood transfusions and support. Um, leukopenia, um, common, but generally doesn't have too many um, sequelae for the patient. And then the thrombocytopenia, the grade three, four toxicity, nearly one in five patients. And then what's really key, and some of this might be due to the heavily pretreated nature of these patients as well, but I think I do think it truly um, is 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 due to the um, uh, treatment uh, to a certain extent. And then what's really key is that all of the patients had significant had had xerostomia to a certain extent. And the xerostomia was actually um, uh, significant enough to, to cause cessation of the treatment in nearly a quarter of the patients. Um, and that's, that's really, really um, important to consider. And I think, you know, we oftentimes kind of downplay in patients in their mind when you consent to consenting patients for these trials and you talk about dry mouth, they think, oh, you know, that's not a big deal, you know, compared to cancer and what it can cause, that's nothing. Um, but I think one thing to consider is patients often are, at times do underreport the xerostomia, and I find in the clinic I really have to specifically question. So some of the data, especially this retrospective data, is probably underreporting on what the level of the xerostomia is. And then you need to think about the sequelae that really affect quality of life that occur as a result of the xerostomia. And there's actually quite a lot. So you get a lot of patients having anorexia, their mouth is so dry, they find it difficult to swallow, they're avoiding a lot of the foods they enjoy or they get dysgesia and they have this awful taste in their mouth because their mouth is so dry. And this is, you know, 24 seven and it can, um, you know, it can be irreversible in most cases. Um, the dry mouth can cause pain, discomfort, it can cause ulceration, it can cause dental issues. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not a side effect to be downplayed. And I would say certainly my observation is much worse than in my alpha treated patients compared to my lutetium treated patients. You know, it's a very rare case where I have a, um, one of my lutetium patients complaining of a grade two xerostomia, um, whereas it's, it, you know, it's very common in these alpha treated patients. And keep in mind that when we're looking at the grades, um, you know, we oftentimes report grade three as kind of, you know, that, that, that's, um, if it's low rates, that's okay. Um, but grade three xerostomia means that they have the, this is the CTCA criteria, inability to adequately element orally, they're being too fed or on TPN. So, you know, that's grade three. So to say only 3% have grade three, that, that's, a, that's a big deal in patients. Um, uh, and you really have to weigh the pros and cons of, of that being a possibility. A lot uh, are having grade two and that, you know, they're, they're needing to drink water all the time. They're waking up with a dry mouth. Their diet is, you know, really modified. So, you know, this is very, very significant, even a grade two. So my perspective, um, so 
I've treated a lot of patients with lutetia and PSMA 617 or INT, um, and it's really well tolerated. And what I find is that it generally maintains or improves quality of life when the patient responds to these treatments. We know there's an the issue of dur durability of response in a lot of patients and, and treatment resistance, and alpha emitters may um, uh, kind of overcome these issues in a subset of patients. But given the increased toxicity seen with the um, uh, alpha emitter, and we are hitting the same target, you know, um, uh, you know, we're hitting PSMA. Yeah, I know there's a lot of talk of kind of tandem treatments and things with an alpha and a beta. We are hitting that same target. You're going to get overlap of toxicity, particularly in the salivary glands. You really, I feel we really need a strong rationale to, to introduce actinium in patients. So patient selection is going to be key. I think it, you know, its role really is going to be later on in the disease course, given the side effects thing. Um, potentially these patients with lower PSMA expression are excluded from a lot of the lutetium studies um, and um, or potentially following lutetium resistance um, where there's PSMA avid disease um, uh, because obviously a lot of these patients don't they have very limited options so I think we're getting good responses but we really need to select get more data to to figure out who we select um, for this the, these treatments and that's it Thanks so much. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen now so we can see everyone. Uh, thanks for that. That was a fantastic overview. I might uh, throw to a poll for the audience so something will show up on your screen you can answer. You don't have to answer it if you're a consumer and don't know. Uh, but the question here is, if we're planning a phase one, two study of a alpha PSMA, where should we position it? Should it be uh, post-lutetium, post an androgen receptor pathway inhibitor and one or two taxanes like the vision trial, uh, post one taxane like the therapy trial, or should we just go post an ARPI and not require uh, chemotherapy? Uh, we might give everyone a few minutes to, to vote on that and then maybe value your comments, uh, Mike Morris, on, on where you would position a phase one, two trial uh, at the moment if you were opening one in your clinic. Yeah, maybe yeah, far away. I think uh, there's a bit right. of a mixture, which means there's no right answer. I think uh, at the moment, leading is post-lutetium PSMA with 42%. And then second is therapy-like. But a lot of people going for it just post-ARPI, pre-chemotherapy, 22%. Uh, and only 13% going for a vision-like population. Where, where would you position it, Mike? I don't disagree that from a regulatory standpoint and drug development standpoint, its first place to be tested is going to be late in the disease course. But I'd venture to remind everyone that the place in which you could probably save the most life years and in which the physics of the, of the alpha may work to greatest treatment benefit is in the micrometastatic setting, in the high-risk localized patient who's just about to undergo definitive local therapy or just following so that you have a possible endpoint of cure as opposed to the disease burden and resistance that's already engendered in a patient who has widely metastatic disease. Yeah, thanks for that. Megan, where, where would you position a phase one, two trial? Um, I agree with what Mike said. Um, you know, you always start these newer agents later on the disease course. When you're trying to figure out toxicity and efficacy, you really need to position it later on in the in the disease. Um, I guess um, uh, you know later on, it, it, once the phase one two studies, the later phase studies, once you have more information on the toxicity and efficacy, you can rationalize putting it earlier on. But but I guess um, as a medical oncologist, I'm always hesitant to say the word cure. It's a uh, very uncommon. So, so I think given the toxicity, I'd be kind of positioning it post chemo. I mean, chemo and prostate cancer are really well tolerated um, and post in RP um, uh, to begin with until we get a lot more information on the um, uh, longevity, like the duration of the serostomia and some of these significant toxicities. I thought I might get a Peter Mack perspective and bring our own associate professor Arun Azad into the panel for a few minutes. What, what, where, where would you position a trial at Peter Mac, given given our current uh, sort of uh, portfolio of available treatments? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, I think um, you know academically, probably almost it's most interesting to look in the post lutetium space. I, don't, I think there's a real unmet clinical need there 
um, you know, Megan summarized it very nicely in her last slide about, you know, high responses and, and well-tolerated treatment with lutetium PSMA, but, you know, durability response and resistance is a challenge. So I think alphas have an interesting role there. I think that, you know, depending on who develops alphas to phase three, if it ends up being industry, you know, sort of developed um, clinical development, then I suspect it'll be pitched late line is a, you know, Mike alluded to this in terms of from a regulatory standpoint, a, you know, a classic pathway in prostate cancer is to take drugs for and uh, take, you know, to, is to start late with drug development and then move the drug forward into more interesting spaces, like Mike has said. So, yeah, very interesting space. And another question that I'm going to launch is if we are doing an alpha trial, how should we combine it? Should we do it on its own, just a alpha PSMA? Should we do it with, in combination with lutetium? There's a big vogue for either an alpha beta sequence or at the same time, a PARP inhibitor. Uh, immunotherapy or or just give it on its own uh, can uh, people vote uh, and interested in your perspectives as well where, where should we position this is this going to be a standalone treatment mike no i doubt it will be a standalone treatment uh at the day's end um and i think you know you you your group and as well the group at as at ucsf has already begun generating data on uh, combinations with PARP and combinations with immunotherapy. So, and, and, and so the concept of RLT plus something is looking quite promising and tolerable in those contexts. Of course, your combinations are with lutetium, but, um, you know, there's, I, I found especially provocative that data that uh, came out of UCSF with, with just a priming dose of uh, radioligand therapy with lutetium followed by checkpoint inhibition, which really looked like there was some legs to the theory that you could have antigen release as a result of RLT and activate otherwise a relatively cold tumor. So I think we'll see what the data look like, but I, I don't. I think that all of these are really quite good and it's hard to tell without data, which will be the best, but I'm sure that all will be tested in combination with alphas as well. Great. Uh, we might just go to the poll and see what people voted. There's really a bit of a split there. It's kind of uh, everywhere, a bit of lutetium, PARP inhibitor, immunotherapy, single agent. It's almost like a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. So maybe we need to uh, test Can I make them all. a comment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess um, to me, prostate cancer, we know it's heterogeneous, um, you know, from genomics and everything else we look at, um, including the data presented on the DL3 expression. Um, and we know in cancer, it's very clever, and you hit one pathway, and there's crosstalk that opens up um, activation of another pathway. So to me, I, I just can't wrap my head around kind of hitting the same target two ways. To me, I think you, uh, I think the way forward, and this is completely my opinion, is is you know synergistic combinations rather than rather than you know hitting that same pathway um, and and potentially driving resistance um, uh, without a counterbalance. But that's that's just my perspective. So there's can one, I Mike. Yeah, can I? Doesn't... Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to make a comment. Who's? Oh, how? No, I was I was just going to say there's one idea that is nascent but there will be soon a clinical trial. Lots of investigators are seeking ways to increase the expression of PSMA. And the group at the University of Washington, the Fred Hutch uh, Cancer Institute, have discovered that HDAC inhibitors, and they've drilled all the way down you know, to the epigenome to show how HDAC inhibition increases the expression of PSMA. And those clinical trials with lutetium-177 PSMA plus an HDAC inhibitor are on the eve of beginning. They're going to start. So that's another way, another whole brand new mechanism to think about when we think about combination trials with PSMA. Thanks, Howard. And, and Jason, what, what did you want to add? Yeah, I actually think the option you didn't add was all of the above. Um, because I think that, you know, you're classing as prostate cancer, you know, mixing new every one of those, um, additions has some really strong, pretty provocative preclinical data, 
whether it be DNA repair drugs or immunotherapy, that you can improve and you can enhance, not additively, but synergistically, the response, at least in preclinical models. But I think it's going to depend what type of prostate cancer you do that in. Um, and I think that's what the question is. A lutetium actinia may, may be enough to get the bulk and then the metastatic disease. Making an immunologically cold version of prostate hot for immunotherapy could be the answer. So I think I'd have added an extra one in there. One, one, you know, all of the above, depending on what type of prostate cancer you're dealing with. And Dr. Boday, do you have any opinions on this, given your really extensive experience, including in neuroendocrine tumors? I think there's a lot of a lot to be learned from your sort of decades of experience with lutetium dotate and now what what should we do with PSMA? Yeah, well, so in principle, I, I totally agree with the panel. All of the above, depending on the clinical setting um, that has to be discovered, there's one thing to be uh, gathered from the experience with uh, dotatate um, or to with the somatostatin receptor targeting uh, theranostics um, is that... Uh, combinations um, have to be specifically devised not to increase toxicity and to, you know, to, to, to have a synergistic tumor effect, yes, but, you know, we know very well when we combined uh, uh, chemotherapy with, uh, with somatostatin receptor targeting agents, sometimes the, the long-term effects uh, uh, were more prominent, particularly to the marrow. So that uh, is obviously important in those protocols when th that are used in a much earlier stage of disease. Obviously, uh, this is less important uh, in, in much ad more advanced uh, stages of disease. One comment that I wanted to make regarding the, uh, mm, uh, let's say, um, induction of overexpression or re-expression, re-differentiation of uh, prostate cancer, what is common uh, to also neuroendocrine tumors is that HDAC inhibitors also uh, promote and we have a study in our uh, in our department. Uh, all, HDAC inhibitors also promote the re-expression of somatostatin receptors, not just a problem, PSMA. So that that opens up possibilities in in all stages in of the uh, neuroendocrine uh, uh, from the neuroendocrine de differentiation to the earlier stages of disease. That's yeah, it's an interesting perspective. Uh... Mike Morris, do you have any opinion on HDAC inhibitors? When I speak to medic, my medical oncology colleagues, they tell me, oh, it, this always looks good in the cell work, but when you translate it to humans, you, you often see a very different picture. Ironically, HDAC inhibitor testing began in prostate cancer. Kevin Kelly, who did the phase one study, uh, he's a prostate cancer attending, he's now at Jefferson. So there's, there is actually history of clinical testing of HDAC inhibitors of prostate cancer who didn't uh, move forward in prostate cancer, probably again because of the heterogeneity of mechanisms of growth in prostate cancer. But, um, you know, there's, there's actually data and, uh, and a trial. And it was, the, it was the beginning of the beginning of HDAC inhibitors in cancer. Thanks. Uh, James, do you want to take us through some random questions? Uh, you can upvote questions and then we can an try and answer the questions get, that get the, uh, the most votes. Uh, Sounds good. So <clears throat> we have one um, that has been addressed, but to Marwa, how has, how has LED-212 different or the same as other alpha emitters such as actinium-225? No, I, I'm just going to quickly jump in next. I didn't. My postdoc who tells this all the time would absolutely shoot me. But strictly speaking, lead 212 isn't an alpha emitter. His daughters are. So <laughs> every time we give the talk, if I don't stress that, I have a postdoc that says, no, it's not an alpha emitter. It's daughters are. So just uh, want to set that there as a radio chemist, the, the ground truth there. <laughs> no, no, you are absolutely correct. So it itself <laughs> is a beta emitter, but it's what is known as an in vivo alpha generator. So it does have clinically yeah. relevant bismuth 212. Um, bismuth 212, I think, is the uh, alpha emitting daughter. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So in terms of their differences, I think it's, um, look, there's risks associated with using any alpha emitter. I think that 
comes part and parcel with using it. Uh, but there, I think the fact that it does have just the single um, daughter, uh, I think that makes it a little bit more stable to work with. I think its dosimetry is a little bit easier to deal with compared to looking at four um, alpha daughters in the actinium 225 decay profile. Uh, there's also issues with less of a recoil effect, um, less uh, side effects there may be. So there's a number of different uh, differences. That's not to say they're deal breakers. Um, actinium 225 has had a very rich history of being utilized in um, different clinical trials at the moment. It's, I guess, the leading, the golden child is what I refer to it. Uh, but I think long term, if we were to build a future proof platform, lead 212, in my opinion, is the way to go. Uh, because there's no really issues with uh, global supply, we can, we've got many different companies leading the charge in developing the generators for use for research and commercial purposes. Um, so some differences, not all deal breakers, but there's space for all of it. There's a question here from Natasha Kendall. Uh, has there been a comparison between lead 212 and actinium 225 or terbium 161 in their ability to treat micrometastatic disease? Jason, are you are are you aware of any direct comparison? Not 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 all three. I mean, the comments we just made about lead, I completely agree with. Um, it, you know, there is pros and cons for everything, but in terms of that, the micro micrometastatic disease, I'm I'm not sure I know. There's a lot of people now really delving into the radiation biology of these systems, comparing say betas with OJs with alphas. Um, and whether or not you know a mixture of those would be good, but I, I'm not aware. I could be wrong of a lead versus um, what was it lead lead versus actinium versus um, terbium. I'm I'm not sure, but you know, especially the terbium side, that's all pretty new. So I think that might still yet to be coming out publicly in in literature. It would love somebody to do it and really look at these at the biological level, radiation biology level. No, you're absolutely right. I think the few papers I've come across, they've modeled a lot of these. Um, they've mm -hmm. compared the data that's out there already. But again, you can't really replace experimental data, clinical data with theoretical, because theoretically, the alpha emitters should have the least side effects because they're so targeted. But from what yeah. uh, we saw in the previous presentations, we're having really adverse side effects for the patients. Um, yeah. So, you know, we'll have to. And I completely agree. And I think, I think that also gets back to your comments about, you know, chelates, conservation momentum. Um, when it, you know, what, what are the ultimate fate of these daughters and how that makes a difference? And yes. whatever parent nuclide you start from is the biggest determining factor. So I completely Absolutely. agree with all the, the things you said earlier. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask David Patterson a question? Because he, one, he's got his hands up, but I want to fire a question to him, one from the panel which is no one's addressed the monoclonal antibody uh, such as J591 with actinium-225, uh, such as the well Cornell experience. Uh, uh, any thoughts on whether we should be using small molecule or antibody with an alpha? Yeah, okay. Thanks, Michael. Um, I mean, I might first just make the comment just relevant to that discussion about, um, you know, actinium-225 versus lead. And I was just going to add, and I think just to elaborate for the audience about the recoil effect, um, that I think this is a really interesting and important element of um, lead 212 uh, for its you know, potential toxicities or hopefully um, lack thereof, is that with the uh, with lead with that yeah with uh, actinium 225 with that first alpha emission um, the recoil effect can really you know shatter the bond um, with the PSMA and then the whole sequence of subsequent um, alpha emissions following that over the next hour um, can occur. They, the, you know, the the um, uh, the products may diffuse out of the cell and uh, and lead to increased toxicity. Whereas with lead, that first emission um, is a is a beta particle, which has much less of an effect on that bond with the chelator. And so you then have significantly more bismuth um, two one two, and then the subsequent um, alpha emission that's delivered should occur ideally within the cell and where the PSMA. Uh, is located. So I think that's a really key and exciting element for hopefully preventing off-target toxicity. Uh, in terms of the comparison to the to the um, antibodies, I mean, I think one of the main concerns has been with 
with bone marrow toxicity, with the longer you know, residence time in the blood with, with antibodies compared to the small molecule inhibitors. Um, so, you know, at this point, yeah, I think it's my preference is, is with the, the small molecules like the current PSMA ligands, but, but I guess we'll, we'll see, time will tell. All right, thank you. Um, we have a lot of other questions, I guess, about 17 minutes, so we can do a little bit of a rapid fire. Uh, I'd have one. Mike was going to make a comment, I think, about the J591. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we shouldn't get out of, ahead of ourselves or ahead of the data in terms of um, deciding up front that the antibodies will have too much marrow tox. If you, if you look at um, the data coming out of uh, Scott and his colleagues' group, you know, they have dose escalated and found no heme tox that's dose limiting. And so they're now moving into their uh, multi-dose studies and combinatorial studies. Um, and so what we expect to happen frequently, we turn out to be wrong. And so I would give the antibodies <laughs> a chance uh, because yeah. actually their data is more mature and looks less toxic than the small molecule data that we have. And also, Mike, to add on that, there are some targets like DNL3, all we have right now is antibodies. There are, mm -hmm. there are some targets which are not amenable at this point to small molecule or peptide-based systems. So, but antibodies are phenomenally good. Sorry, Megan, I didn't mean to jump in. I didn't know if you were trying to jump in there, but antibodies work. Yeah, if I, yeah and I think the salivary toxicity is less um, potentially. Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, much less, which is good for the alpha. If I can add one brief comment to this discussion, uh, antibody works and, uh, you know, the um, distribution of the antibody as seen at the um, diagnostic PET shows also uh, the, the more or less uh, blood pool uptake. And, uh, for example, you saw that the LL3 antibodies are very, very very good target to background ratio. So that, that's also a guidance. And I'd have a question for David again. Um, so given the therapy B uh, trial that you're setting up, are there any radiation exposure concerns with the 2.6 MeV uh, gamma coming from the thallium uh, 208 from the, uh, the lead 212 decay? Um, yeah, look, not any major concerns. You know, it's a reasonably low uh, administered activity. Um, and with that, that high energy, I mean, it's actually less likely to interact as well. So at this point, um, we don't have any, you know, major concerns uh, for impact on radiation safety. So I did note that there were lots of radiation safety officers that uh, registered for this meeting, many more than last time. I think that's probably a marker of Pluvicto coming into the market and many centres establishing a Theranostics program and suddenly encountering oh, there's issues around radiation and administering this particularly in high volumes. Uh, so is this going to be a problem with, with alphas, James? What, what do you think? Alphas versus beta and radiation protection precautions. Bigger issue or smaller issue? I think it all depends on which alpha you're using. So if you're using, for example, radium uh, 223 doesn't matter. Uh, if you're going with, um, you know, for example, with, with lead 212, there are more considerations uh, for minimizing radiation to staff uh, when you have like higher energy uh, levels that you can get on a, a longer term basis. But I think in, in general, there's an advantage to the alphas here yeah. uh, because of their ultra short path length and uh, lutetium-177 or iodine has quite a bit of uh, gamma emission. So uh, both staff and uh, relatives are exposed, but with alpha emitters, there's, there's not a lot of uh, exposure to other staff. So whilst they're more dangerous to the individual patient, uh, they, they tend to be uh, less problematic. Just need a sheet of paper for shielding. Just need a sheet of paper for shielding, that's right. <laughs> um, all right, we had, there was a question about dosimetry also, I guess for David, uh, do you have anything uh, set up in the LED 212 around that? Uh, look, certainly we're hoping to, to gather some, some data on that, it's uncertain you know, it, we think that the um, 
you know, the emissions for, for SPECT should be at the, the sort of limit for detection in, in tumour. It depends on how avid they are, um, but we are looking to do some dosimetry on, on sort of renal dosimetry and, and hoping to be able to image the salivary glands. But it's a question is with that dose escalation when that will become viable. But hopefully at a therapeutic dose, um, we anticipate we should be able to get uh, some reasonable images for dosimetry. Great, right. thank you. I have a question for Dr. Baudet. Um, so can you speak a little more about the potential to treat uh, neuroendocrine prostate cancer with radionuclide dotatate theranostics? Uh, obviously, uh, this is the, the first thing that one thinks. Uh, you connect the word neuroendocrine and we, we, we think of somatostatin receptor expression, but uh, that figure uh, in the animal xenograph that we showed before, it's not just anecdotal, it's a, a everyday practice. Uh, neuroendocrine prostate cancer um, uh, frequently expresses very heterogeneous amounts of somato or densities of somatostatin receptors, and usually the uptake at dotatate PET is, is low, much lower than the, the normal liver. So it's unfortunately not always a viable option. It, it, it's not, let's say, um, there is heterogeneity and there is variability, but as in general, typically, uh, it's not the most viable of options. Thanks. It's interesting. There's actually um, a study from Sherbrooke with uh, Brigitte Garin, uh, the three tempo triple um, uh, PET imaging with uh, PSMA, uh, dotatate, and FTG. And essentially, of the, all of those patients, none of them would have been potentially eligible either uh, for, for dotatate treatment. There's an interesting question here from an Australian, which says, when, when is lutetium coming on Medicare in Australia? And will they use the James Buteau criteria or a blanket bomb a la Vision USA style criteria? Uh, James, do you want to answer that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, I don't think we should close our eyes and treat blindly. It's just not the vision I have for theranostics. Uh, we do have some definitive data with therapy. We do know that the SUV mean on PSMA PET is predictive, so we can actually select and get good responses. We don't want to have underwhelming responses, and I think that you know MCRPC is very lethal. We we those that we know have low uptake won't get good uh, response from SUV means in that lower quartile, the low seven, uh, we can probably either, you know, get onto combination treatments or more active treatments such as Kabazi. So uh, I guess the question is whether, as we move to alphas, do we need more selection or less selection? Can I just put in, because the question about when are we going to get access in Australia, I had a meeting with Novartis Global yesterday and they told me they submitted for TGA approval, regulatory approval in Australia last or 30th of June. So, so they finally started a pathway to get us uh, into the market here. Yeah, we really do look forward to more widespread global availability of, of lutetium PSMA and there's a number of compounds coming through now. So, so it's happening. There's another question about what criteria we use for PSMA response. Uh, I might throw that one to Mike Morris. Uh, how should we should we be using PSMA PET to assess response? That's such a hard question, um, and 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 the other the caveat to that is response for what purpose? Is that clinical decision making? Is that a regulatory criteria? I think that you know there are clearly published uh, criteria that set the table for looking at PSMA PET as a post-treatment uh, endpoint in which to follow. What we, we have missing from that is the correlation of a given biomarker, whatever that might be, SUV mean, SUV max, distribution of disease, total disease burden. So what is the biomarker that is associated with clinical benefit, i.e., OS. So there's a big piece missing, the identification of the, the data element that is associated with the clinical outcome and what that association is. So I think that, you know, Michael uh, and others, um, Howard, uh, uh, have been very supportive of 
our efforts to work with regulatory agencies in order to have a roadmap to establishing what a response would look like on PSMA with regulatory recognition. But I'd have to say we're not there yet. Um, so we're still right now left with clinical trials that are collecting the data and the associations between PSMA PET and outcome. And we'll need to do better in terms of identifying a set or single uh, element of the scan that we can call our leading biomarker to, to qualify. Yeah, all our clinical trials are really still using CT and bone scan. And as nuclear medicine specialists, we report a lot of bone scans. And I think it's fair to say that we do find them challenging. They're not so easy to read compared to a PSMA pet. Uh, Lisa, do you want to comment just from a reporting perspective, trying to uh, uh, you know, a formal criteria aside, trying to work out if a patient's progressed on a bone scan compared to a, a PSMA PET? Yeah, I, I agree. It's not, uh, it's not easy, but that's the direction that we are going to. Uh, there are several uh, uh, retrospective series which have uh, um, been published by uh, multi-centric groups uh, from, uh, from Germany, from uh, uh, from Australia, from uh, uh, California, uh, that that show that there is a correlation, for example, with the interim pet uh, uh, and the uh, survival parameters. There's now a very limited series, but very promising series uh, regarding the end of treatment PET scan uh, and the impact on survival. So uh, I'm hoping that we can have prospective data which correlate uh, better. Now, as to the relationship between uh, <clears throat> the PSMA, the response at PSMA imaging and bone scan, obviously we still need, we still need data. Uh, as a nuclear medicine and coming from the experience of neuroendocrine tumors, it seems logical since we are treating, if we're talking about um, lutetium PSMA, we're treating PSMA avid disease, it seems logical also to um, uh, investigate what happened to the PSMA avid disease and restage with PSMA, but we certainly do pros need prospective data. We've got but Declan back on the panel. Fantastic. What a, what a fantastic webinar. I've thoroughly enjoyed this as a simple urologist, I must say. I really do feel that whole area of radioligand therapy is opening right up and um, we're going to have to draw to a halt in a moment I think Michael we're coming up to uh, the end of the slot and we all have to dial into the Peter Mac uh, tumor board meeting in a couple of seconds as well uh, finishing comments from you Michael and we'll throw back to Howard yeah it's been a fantastic webinar it's clearly it's a very hot topic uh, alphas I think it's we're going to hear a lot more about it really excited to see some phase one two trials coming through uh, no doubt we'll see some phase three trials following. I think, uh, Howard, do you want to give us some closing messages or thoughts? Um, well, my thoughts are that um, this is truly a dream team on the, uh, on the panel today. Um, thank you for putting this together, Michael. Uh, I too feel that the progress being made in radioligand therapy for patients is exemplary. Very early days, as Megan admitted, uh, very, very early days, but trial by trial, we're learning more and more. And I would just urge the patients on this webinar, see clinical trials, because um, we're not gonna get, we're not gonna move the ball down the field, whether it's rugby or American football without uh, participation in trials. It's really critical. So thanks to the Peter Mac and everybody else for their time today. Thanks so much, Declan. There are many questions that we haven't been able to get yes. to, and you're the social media guru. What's the best platform in 2023 to, to take those questions yeah, yeah. to? Because Twitter's going downhill a little bit. It's become a bit miserable, hasn't it? But it, uh, I, I haven't switched on to threads or whatever. James, you're shaking your head. I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe PCF should just set something up and we'll all fall into line uh, as, as usual. But I think, yeah, there, were, there are quite a few good questions we need to get to. Uh, we will post this. Uh, there were some um, slides and audio issues. We'll tidy it up and post it as a podcast and a video podcast over the next few days. And if you follow Michael or Prostake or us, um, you'll find access to that. But then thanks again to all these uh, amazing investigators. It's so exciting listening to this stuff. I've got to tell you, um, as a simple clinician, 
physician, urologist, looking after prostate cancer patients full time. I'm just incredibly excited by everything that I've heard uh, th this morning or this evening. So that's it, Michael. Wonderful. We're we'll do it again in another few months. We will. And thank you all very much for joining us. And uh, we wish you all a very good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.